Never ignore your gut feeling the hairs on the back of your neck. If it doesn't feel right, stop. Ask yourself why. If you still can't figure it out, don't do it. Welcome to Flying BC, a podcast about the people, planes, and aviation adventures in British Columbia and Canada, with your host, Warwick Patterson. Thanks for joining us for the very first episode of the Flying BC podcast. As a filmmaker and producer, I've been working on a Flying BC video series, but so much of the video interviews get left on the cutting room floor. So I thought there's an opportunity to offer expanded content through the podcast format. With the addition of our fantastic guest hosts, the podcast is taking on a life of its own. Today, I thought we should get to know our co-hosts and explore the common theme among them, which is the desire to give back to aviation and involve themselves in education. There's some great nuggets of wisdom in this episode, and I can't wait to dig deeper into these topics in upcoming shows. So, let me introduce everybody. Kate Klassen was a Class 2 flight instructor for many years, and more recently co-founded Coastal Drone Company, an RPAS education and consulting business. She's been a key figure in working with Transport Canada and others as they get to grips with the drone world. She's also one of our BC and Yukon regional directors at COPA. Ryan Van Heeren is a commercial pilot turned Victoria Terminal Controller and has his own aviation coaching business, Cardinal Aviation. He's flown everything from twin otters in the Arctic to Challenger corporate jets and can often be seen low and slow over the gravel bars in his yellow bearhawk. A lot of listeners will probably know him best as president of the BC General Aviation Association, which has had a pretty profound effect on the flying community in BC. Kevin Mayer has been flying for Air Canada for over 20 years and currently flies the 777. When he's not cruising high above the earth, his real passion is classic round engine airplanes. You'll see him happily at the controls of a Harvard or Beaver or honing his Stearman aerobatic routine. Not only has he literally written a book on Stearman aerobatics, but he's finishing up a painstaking 20 year Stearman restoration project. I had the pleasure of seeing it earlier this week and it's pretty spectacular. And my name is Warwick Patterson. I grew up around airplanes and air shows, but I didn't start flying myself until more recently. I earned my PPL in 2017, bought an old Cessna, and haven't looked back. I'm hoping to bring some of my film and TV experience to our corner of the aviation world to help expose more people to the magic of this thing we get to do, and sponge up as much knowledge as I can myself, of course. Speaking of knowledge, I'd like to welcome Ryan, Kate, and Kevin to episode one of Flying BC. So, it's a bit of a cliche way to start things off on an aviation podcast, but uh, it's always interesting to hear how people discovered aviation and made it their career. Um, so, I'll ask each of you, what was your path into aviation? Let's start with uh, Ryan. Hey, Warwick. Uh, thanks for having me on this. It's uh, super exciting to do this and just another way to, to grow our community. So, um, I've been in aviation for 20 years now. Um, I'm the first in my family. I didn't grow up in a in an aviation family. I didn't have a, a dad or an uncle that was an airline pilot for me. It was just something uh, since I was probably four years old, I just said, I'm going to be a pilot and there was no looking back. Um, I'm not sure if at that young age, I boxed myself into this and didn't give myself any other options, but uh, I got no regrets either way. So uh, for me, I just grew up every opportunity going to the airport, uh, watching airplanes, uh, at, in grade 10, I got my first job baggage handling at YVR, uh, loading up the fishing charters, going up to the Charlottes. Uh, in grade 12, uh, got a job with Air North when they opened up their Vancouver base as a check-in agent and baggage handler uh, with the hopes of, of one day getting into one of their airplanes. Uh, I started flying pretty young in my teens. Uh, I was really fortunate with my parents there. We kind of set up a deal where any money that I earned towards my uh, flying, they match. So... I was able to get a bit of an early start, which I'm super fortunate to to have had the chance to do. But that said, I also got into all this right after 9-11 uh, in the early 2000s. So my first solo was June 25th, 2000. Um, so I was right in the middle of all my training when 9-11 happened, and the industry really changed at that point. And that's a whole other podcast. But um, 
put it this way, by the time I got my commercial, you had to have close to 2,000 hours to even sniff the inside of a Navajo. So it was a real grind just trying to find every possible opportunity um, to get anywhere near an airplane in a working capacity. And what it really taught you to do is how to effectively network. And, and that's so important for anybody getting into this industry, um, more so before, but uh, even though it's less important now, I think it's still such an important tool that uh, budding or aspiring pilots need to need to master is, is, is building your network, um, maintaining relationships, not just calling people when, when you need something and, and helping that work for you and helping others when the opportunity comes. So uh, anyway, long story short, worked for Air North for three years. And after three years, they said, hey, it's been great, um, but it's going to be another three years before you see the inside of an airplane. And I'm not the most patient individual. So I gave my notice right then and there and moved to Calgary. No place to live, no job, no plan. All I knew is that's where the jobs were. Um, I moved to Calgary on my last shift at Air North. I was at the airport and I went to uh, A&W to grab a bite to eat. And I had my truck packed in the parking lot. And there was two uh, Air Canada jazz pilots in line in front of me and never pass up an opportunity to network. Right. So um, I ended up saying, hey, where are you guys based? Just to strike up a conversation. And, and he goes, oh, Calgary, ever been? And I said, actually, I'm moving there today. He goes, looking for a flying job? I said, yep. He goes, okay, well, you got a place to live? I said, nope. And he goes, well, I got a basement, 300 bucks a month. You just got to look after my dog when I'm flying. I said, I'll see you tomorrow. So we look for all these opportunities, got a job busting tables, um, going to the airport every other day, handing out resumes. And I applied to Ken Boric Air every two weeks for almost two and a half years. I tried everything from putting my resume on 11 by 14 paper, cardboard, attaching a pack of gum just so it would stick out when they're flipping through it and um, never got a call um, until I ended up, anyway, we'll cut to the chase here. Did some bag, uh, some uh, bank check flying in Alberta on Navajos. Um, from that, a little bit of PC-12 flying and then through network and knowing people who knew people, um, made a contact at Bork and Went to Ken Boric Air in the Twin Otter, where I was based in Resolute Bay, uh, working the Arctic on wheels and skis, uh, Callowit, Inuvik, and then the Maldives on floats. Came back to BC after the Maldives, uh, flew Beach 1900s and uh, King Air 350s on Medevac, and then Lear on Medevac. And uh, when we lost that contract, I went to a corporate job uh, flying a corporate Challenger 601 for a company out of Vancouver. Uh, about six years ago, uh, ended up in air traffic control. That's a whole nother story how that happened. There isn't one one big reason. It's just kind of a story in and of itself. And um, that's what I do now. And I love it. I get to play on both sides of the mic. It's uh, a job that allows me to partake in general aviation and be able to do that, which I'm grateful for. And um, here we are, uh, just enjoying the community and and on my days off now, I've got my company Cardinal Aviation, and I work with a lot of general aviation pilots trying to bring commercial uh, standards and standard operating procedures um, into their airplanes and hopefully make them safer and kind of more proficient in advanced aircraft operation. So that's the short version. And we've got a couple hundred podcasts to go for the long version. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'm thinking patience is a virtue as a pilot based on that story. <laughs> Uh, so Kate, you're next. Hey, Warwick. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, my origin story in aviation is pretty much as opposite to Ryan's as you can get. I um, didn't grow up holding onto the airplane or the airport fence, although I did uh, grow up quite close to um, the Halifax airport and would lay in the grass in the summer and watch planes overhead, but never really envisioned that being something that I could do or would do. And uh, I did have um, a scout leader that took uh, a group of us flying once. And it did kind of pique my interest at that point. But again, it wasn't really on my radar, so to speak. And then when I was in grade 12, looking at what, what comes next, what do I do? My, my father is a, a dean at a university. So it wasn't do you want to go to post-secondary? It's where are you going to post-secondary? So when we were having a discussion about what it was that I wanted to do, I kind of half-jokingly said I want to be an astronaut. And his response was, well, most astronauts are pilots first. Why don't you find somewhere you can do that? And that was the first time that it was really like, oh, that's, that is an option. Like, that's something that I could do. 
And then we just happened to be driving with friends, picking up, uh, like, I think it was a boyfriend of a sister or something, some random connection, uh, from the airport. And he was asking, you know, us being in grade 12, what are we doing? And I said, I want to be a pilot, but I don't know how yet. And he said there was a, an aviation, a business and aviation program at the University of New Brunswick, and I should look into that. So that's what I ended up doing. I um, moved from Halifax to Fredericton and did the three full year program that I don't think exists anymore at the University of New Brunswick, where I graduated with a BBA. But instead of taking elective courses, all of my flying hours were credited towards my degree. So it was a pretty rough three years. It was pretty nonstop with all the extra flying and uh, on top of the coursework. But um, when I graduated, it was like your 200 hour wonder. Now, what are you going to do? And I, there was no one on the East Coast that could do a instructor rating. So I messaged around and I had family in Ontario and BC and on Av Canada, someone said, if you're going to be in BC, then this is the school to do it. This, this is the guy you want to do your, your flight instructor rating with. So I picked up everything and moved to BC for six months. And now it's been about 10 years. Um, and it's been fantastic. So I ended up getting my instructor rating and then working at the school that I did my rating at. And I've always had this, um, I was given really good advice growing up that you take every opportunity that you're given to learn something new. Um, And so when we had, uh, when I had a coworker leave who was the accredited ROCA examiner, I asked to take on that role and got that accreditation with Industry Canada at the time. And then that led me to doing ROCA certifications for drone pilots as they started to kind of come up in the industry in around 2014. And two of those people had just started a drone company and were looking to create a ground school for drone pilots. But obviously there's lots of, um, lots of areas that overlap with what manned aircraft pilots need to know. Meteorology is still the same. Theory of flight still happens the same way. So um, I helped them build out that ground school. And then it was like, well, since you helped us create it, do you want to help us teach it? So I did that a couple of times. They're like, well, since you taught it a couple of times, do you want to keep teaching it? So then I did it part-time and then full-time and then managed that program and then ended up um, kind of splintering off and doing my own thing uh, with Coastal Drone. We recorded the ground school, put it online. It was much more effective at reaching Canadians without burning me out at the same time. And that's been my life for the last three years is running Coastal Drone and in it's really exciting to be on that side of the industry where you see um, things are changing much more rapidly than you tend to see on the traditional side of things. Um, There's not that history of things being written in blood and uh, you know, we've, we do it this way because we've always done it this way. It's been very creative and very inventive and that's been really exciting for me because that's, that's where I'm creative. I'm not musically talented. I can't draw, but being creative on the business side, on the drone side of things has been, been really exciting. So that's where I came from and how I got to be where I'm at. Awesome. It's uh, yeah, it's definitely a new and emerging market that's changing fast. No kidding. And Kevin, over to you. Okay. Yeah. The defining moment for me was um, our family was on a trip to Seattle and our car broke down, uh, and for a day we were hanging around waiting for a new clutch to get put in it and we broke down right in front of a crop duster airstrip and the guy let me sit in the airplanes and I thought this is what I want to do and I grew up in Ladner in an agricultural area so started earning money in summer jobs starting at around 12 years old uh, because I knew my parents wouldn't be able to fund this and also started hanging around Delta Air Park which was a huge sort of center of vintage aircraft and and it was a very vibrant place so eventually did get my pilot's license uh, did my private and commercial in a super cub went to get a job and it was the biggest recession anyone has ever seen it was the early 80s interest rates were 20 percent airbc twin autopilots were working at mcdonald's um, but I did get a job crop spraying because I'd worked on farms and had 200 hours in a tailwheel airplane. So I did that for five, six summers, uh, 
and there was nothing to do in the winter, so I went to university because I was bored, and eventually I got enough credits they kicked me out. So uh, then I flew some air tankers for a year and some air ambulance and air cargo and a little bit of bush flying in a DC-3 and finally got to AirBC and that was an awesome job. Man, I, I, I didn't have to load freight. I got a nice uniform. I'd, I'd hit the big leagues. Um, one of the things that had always held me back is I've always worn glasses and when I learned to fly, couldn't work for the airlines, couldn't join the Air Force, even the colleges wouldn't take my money. Like, so I never really expected to be an airline pilot. So sitting in that dash eight, man, I'd, I'd hit the big times. And um, things changed and I applied to Air Canada and I got hired and uh, that was a long time ago and I'm just uh, going through the 777 command course now and it's uh, it's great fun. And uh, But I've never lost my interest in general aviation. That's what brought me into aviation and, and, and that's my passion. So because I got quite a lot of heavy tailwheel time um, I started, and also a lot of maintenance experience uh, in my early jobs, I, I started flying a lot of really neat vintage airplanes, uh, warbirds, uh, I've been flying some aerobatics and air shows, so yeah, that's kind of how I got to where I'm, I am, I've been very, very fortunate. It's funny, Kevin, we're, uh, we're all sitting here on a video chat recording this, and there's four of us, and all four of us are sitting here wearing glasses, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it 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 was just a non-starter. I, yeah. In, in nineteen in nineteen eighty, you needed twenty thirty vision to do anything, but but fly fly anything bigger than a DC three. Yeah. Huh. Cool. I did. Uh, Kate, it was funny hearing you about the university thing. My folks were the same. You're going to go get a degree, and I'm like, no, I just want to fly. So I ended up going to one of the university programs out here. And it was one of the two-year diploma programs, so you're never really going to get a degree. And I'd done everything, all the flying, all the, the coursework, and I had one final exam left. And it was accounting. I wasn't very good at it anyway. And uh, I got a call to do uh, to get a, an interview for a, a ramp job at Vancouver Airport and to you know hopefully get into an airplane at some point. And then it was like, write the accounting final or go to the job interview to toss bags at the airport. And I went for the job interview to toss bags. And I didn't get the baggage handling job and I also never got the diploma so here we are. Oh no. <laughs> I, I had a, a bit of a Hobson's choice because the economy turned around. I did a five-year degree just because there was nothing else to do in the winters and in the last year I could have got a job flying in Navajo and do I abandon the five-year degree or do I you know anyway I, I stuck out the schooling and it did pay off because I, I suspect that the degree was a fairly important thing when I got hired at Air Canada. You know, to say have an engineering degree probably helped <laughs> rather than another 400 hours in an Navajo. <laughs> it's amazing, Kevin. You got an engineering degree and a personality. It's like the jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the university asked me not to come back. I don't think they were too impressed with me. <laughs> well, when I was going through the business program, it was kind of like you know, if I had that choice of do I go for that that night flight tonight or do I study for the exam, I'd always opt for the flying because that's what my focus was. I was going to, like, this is how I pursue my dreams. Um, when am I ever going to use this business degree? And now that's, you know, what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day business. Day-to-day -day is running a business and ended up having to do an MBA to pick up on all the stuff that I wasn't paying attention to when I did my bachelor's. I think there's a lot of a lot of crossovers between business and aviation um, in a couple ways, and especially in the educational side. Um, you can be super book smart, so you can go do all the four-year degrees you want and learn all the buzzwords on business and all the flow charts and all the triangle hierarchies and all this stuff, and it doesn't mean you're going to be any good at business, right? No, you can be no. street smart, and the same thing same thing with flying, right? You can take all all the courses and do all the reading you want, and at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a good pilot, so... Talking the talk versus walking the walk. Yeah. yeah. Street smarts versus book smarts. I, I think you need both, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah, it's a balance. Mm -hmm. Some entrepreneurial uh, talents and, yeah. Uh, so this is a good segue into um, what I was going to talk about today, which is um, your PPL is basically a license to learn. 
And it's hard to think of many other industries where the learning never ends quite like aviation. Like until the day you stop flying, you're learning. Um, and you guys are all have been involved in giving back as mentors and as educators. Um, so, and Kevin, we recently talked about the level and quality of pilots coming into the airline funnel. And it seems to me like mentoring and passing down knowledge is going to be even more important moving forward. Yeah, I guess where to start, this could be a huge podcast. I think all of us could weigh in. If, if I can have a, a 30 second sound bite to anyone listening to this that is learning to fly, um, I, I would say, please, please, please pay attention to the basics. Um, I, I, I give a lecture to flying schools and, and the title is uh, The Fundamentals. They're not stepping stones, they're foundation stones. And I think people need to, in the first several hundred hours of their flying, um, really drill down onto the basic airmanship, aircraft handling, um, things like that. There's lots of time afterwards to learn how to run the G1000 glass panel and, and, and stuff like that. But we're even seeing it now in the airlines that, you know, sometimes we're having to go back in our training programs and, and, and teach things that previously we just assumed people knew. I think it's a, it's a sign of the times in the industry too, though, because if you rewind 15 years in order to, you know, even sniff the inside of a Dash 8 or, you know, a 705 operation, you had to go and, for lack of better terms, pay your dues and go, you know, fly the poorly equipped aircraft and, you know, that might not have been the best maintained and in, in pretty harsh conditions and kind of cut your teeth and, and gain some experience that way. And I mean, there's no better time to get into aviation than right now in terms of jobs. But, you know, I was having this conversation with a buddy the other day and it'd be really easy to sit here and resent the new pilots coming in that, you know, for lack of better terms, have it fairly easy getting into the, the, the cushy job. But at the same time, if you take a step back and think about it, um, I, I don't resent them. In fact, I almost feel sorry that they might not have had the opportunity to go and, and, and have that, those couple of years of, you know, really honing the fundamentals in, in an operational setting. No, you're exactly right, Brian, or Brian. And, and that's, that's actually kind of my point is that, um, in those first 200 hours, learn the basics because you may not have the opportunity later in the pay your dues part. That's, that's, I think we're saying the same thing. The the two planes that I learned to fly on, the two 172s, were, I think, three and five years old when I went through my training. One of them had a glass cockpit, G1000, and I had never seen carb heat until I moved to BC. <laughs> and all of these things were, like, things you read about in a book. And I think... I. I absolutely learned more about flying getting my instructor rating than I did getting my CPL like and like multi IFR I graduated with and I learned more in my instructor rating about being a pilot and needing to teach the material is what puts it into your brain and if you can't explain it well then you don't well know it well enough so like that experience was really like formulative for me because without that I like I look back at some of the stuff that I was trying to do or was doing as a newly minted CPL. And it's just, it was just a, such a small piece. It was, really didn't know what I didn't know at that point. That's what I'm doing with my, uh, my CPL. I've said, I've realized that I want to get my instructor rating afterwards. So I should be doing my CPL almost as if I'm doing my instructor rating, like learn to teach everything right off the bat. I'm learning the same stuff I need for my CPL. Um, start flying from the right seat a little more doing all those things that I'll go and pass my CPL and then right away I could go pass my instructor rating. And you'll be able to land on the center line from the right seat, which is... Yeah. <laughs> I think like by far the best way to, to really understand something is to teach it. But I think aviation has got to be one of the only, I want to, for lack of better terms, complex industries where everything is backwards and you have those with the least experience teaching new pilots. Like... Where, where else do you go and learn a complex task from somebody who just got their license and is using that opportunity to teach, to get experience, to go get a, again, air quotes, real job. Yeah. And it, that's kind of unique to 
Canada and maybe some other countries too, because I know it's in Europe, it's a little bit backwards to what we see here where, you know, you're senior at an airline and that's when you become a flight instructor. The, uh, the flight instructors, I just came back from Abu Dhabi and the flight instructors there, whether it's the ab initio or the advanced, are worshipped. Like there's, they are the cornerstone of the whole industry. It's so different to what we see here. And they're very experienced as well. Do you think we're going to see some of those older pilots coming back into the instructor realm here? Um, it seems like there's been a wave that have been taken away to the airlines and maybe those will come back later. I think it's tough because the job hasn't been an attractive one. It's something that you do because you need a way to build time and the hours and the pay don't necessarily reflect the, the work that goes into that role. So for those that have that passion and want to you know, translate that knowledge to a new generation of pilots, then I think we're really lucky to have some of those people as instructors, but it's a tough it's not exactly attractive, I don't think, unless you have that internal drive to be there. It's a bit of a double-edged sword because the cost of flight training is a huge barrier to people getting into aviation to begin with. So when they try to bring the cost down, something has to give and you hope it's not aircraft maintenance and at the end of the day, it becomes instructor pay. So, I mean, I have a friend who's a retired 777 captain. I think we all know him. And he just recently renewed his class three flight instructor and he's passionate. I mean, like any of us, we would do this for free, but we shouldn't because it just drives our industry down. Um, and he went, he wants to give back and he wants to get back into instructing, but one of the premier flight schools in Vancouver is, you know, going to pay him $27 an hour to instruct. And where's the draw for somebody who's got, you know, 30,000 hours of real world flight experience who could pass on so much to new pilots. Where's the draw at $27 an hour to instruct? And that's, $27 that's the tough a part. flight hour, not even an hour. And that's just it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's, it's tough. Right. And, and to compound matters with the way the industry is going is pilots that are going to get their ab initio license, they start with one instructor and right now instructors aren't lasting more than six months or a year before they're picked up by the airline. So, there's not a lot of continuity there even for the students. But again, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kevin, you, you mentioned you, you do a talk on the fundamentals, and I was just talking to Ryan about this too, about how you learn to fly in a 172. I bought a 172, so for the past like three years, I've been bashing around flicking the same four switches. And you get a little complacent sometimes with standard checks and protocols and... Ryan, you've flown so many different panels recently. You're flying different planes. Those acronyms and standards really come into effect when you start jumping from plane to plane. And I think it's something you lose a little bit in your first training. And you think, oh, I, I know how to flow check. I know by memory all these things. Um, but yeah, Ryan, you're, you're, you're saying something about um, standards. You can deviate yeah, I think, from them um, if you know them. Yes. Yeah, Here's the thing is the Canadian aviation regulations are, are the rules, right? And it, but they don't substitute pilot decision-making at the end of the day, the pilot needs to do what the pilot needs to do to assure a safe outcome of the flight and procedures are the same way. Um, there's something we have to learn. There's something we have to respect, but they're not something we always need to follow because there are situations that come up where we have to deviate from them. And what they do is procedures give us, a baseline from which to deviate from should we need to. So if you develop solid fundamentals and understand that at the end of the day, an airplane is an airplane, um, they're just all operated in a slightly different fashion, except for Kevin's. I mean, that's a whole nother ball of wax with his big radials. That's just not another airplane. Those are special. Mm, they're not that, once you get them running, they're not that different. <laughs> So establishing the fundamentals and your baseline procedures allow you to adapt to different aircraft. And for example, I was recently um, on a recurrent SIM course with a client on the TVM 850 and it's got the G1000 NXI all glass and all the bells and whistles. It's amazing. And we're sitting there and shooting an approach into, I think it was Aspen, Colorado on the SIM and we had the, the weather was crap and something was busted and 
here I am trying to like load up this approach and you can pull up the plates in the G1000, but I've also got my iPad with the plates and, you know, you can use GPS for everything, but you can also go to like raw data and just have an old school, you know, VHF nav and HSI. And he kept saying, you know, you can get that in the G1000, you know, you can get that in the G1000. I said, yeah, but I've just got my way of doing things because you always fly this TBM. So that is always there for you. But I've got my standard way of doing things that work in every single airplane I fly. And last week alone, I flew a single Comanche TBM 850, PA 46, uh, Malibu, and a Navajo. And so I've got ways that work for me that are standardized, that work in any aircraft type. And then we just make the subtle changes based on which aircraft it is of the day. And then, Kevin, you've been uh, doing some pretty intense training in the past month on the 777 too, which is probably very aircraft specific, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. My particular, well, I'm doing a command upgrade course and I've been flying the airplane for seven years. So for me personally, there's a few things I'm learning about the airplane, but it's, it's more about moving over to the left seat. It's only three feet away, but there's days it feels like three miles away. And yeah, tell us a little bit about that because when you're flying as a first officer and a, a captain, you, you guys are trading flying duties, um, depending on the leg. So what is it that you're learning um, in the captain transition that's different from what you would learn flying the plane? Uh, well, one thing that the captains do uh, that the FOs don't do is taxi the airplane. And the analogy I'll give you is you've spent 25 years driving your Mazda Miata around. It's You're really good at it. And then someone says, here, park this semi-trailer. Um, the taxiing on that airplane is wild, the oversteering. Um, I was getting gently criticized because I was one foot off the center line at some point on a taxiway or two feet, which is nothing. You know, it's hard to see. And the guy said, no, this airplane is so big that the edges of the taxiway aren't that far away. So, you know, suddenly precision becomes important. They're not just being picky. It's important. The oversteer is is really uh, quite bizarre to get used to. The nose wheel is 14 feet behind the seat. So if you're on a making a 90 degree turn from one narrow, one standard taxiway to another, you're actually over the edge of the taxiway when you're turning, like physically you, you can't see the taxiway. Um, so taxiing is one. And the other issue is that flying the airplane is usually pretty straightforward, but as the captain, you're the, the ringmaster of the circus and you're, you're dealing with so many things, um, flight attendant issues, passenger issues, maintenance issues, you know, flow times, you know, if something's going wrong and you got this flow time, are you going to make it or not? So what I've been finding is that all these ancillary things are taking my brain away from flying the airplane. And so it's divide, it's not dividing my attention, but prioritizing my attention as to what I need to think about next. Whereas as the FO, you just sort of flew the airplane and, and had great input into decision making about flying the airplane, but you tended not to get involved in all these other ancillary things. Yeah. Well, just to drag it back to GA, though, the, the lesson I'm learning is that you do need to prioritize. There's a time to say, okay, this is an important issue, but right now it's a distraction to something that's important, you know, has safety implications. And if, if there's something I could give to a, a GA person, it's, it's you know, if, if, if you're doing something that, that, it, that the safety of your flight depends on, don't get distracted by you know, whatever it is that's, that, that, that's creeping into your situation. That seems to be the big thing that everybody, you, you don't necessarily learn it in flying school, but it comes with experience. I think there's uh, there's three questions I like to, I've got, always got three questions for every scenario and sometimes they're different. I got my IFR three questions that I always have IFR pilots ask themselves when we're working on something, but this is something I use with air traffic control trainees when we're training new controllers. I use it with pilots. I also use it with my three and seven year old kid. So it works. And it's for every decision, ask yourself three questions is, should I do it? Am I allowed to do it? And is this a good idea? And if the answer to any one of those three questions is no, just stop. And no matter how many times we preach it or we put it out there, we're all still prone to making bad decisions or as some would say, opening up learning opportunities. And Kate, as an instructor, what, what helped you 
teach people sort of those aspects of flying? Um, one thing that I, like I struggle with in regular life, but also when I was an instructor was allowing people to take mistakes to a safe point, but trying to let them see that it was an error. And I get a little type A and controlling with seeing people do that in business or with my husband or anything. So it's like, I, but that was something that is a skill that developed as an instructor. It's like, okay, how, how long do I let this go? Cause when you're not also focused on flying a plane, you're able to sit there and think, you know, we'd be like North of Pitt Meadows by six miles. And I'd be like, yeah, they're going to be really high on this approach because you can see how far behind the plane they already are. So it's like, like, how do I guide this? Do I want to allow this mistake to happen? You know, are they able, are they going to be able to catch up? Are they going to be able to process this and, and learning how that varies with different personalities and different approaches and just how the day is going, being able to like build those people reading skills as well. So we're, we're almost 45 minutes into this now, so I'm not going to go on too much longer, but, um, I guess let's wrap up. What what would be one thing if you had one lesson with a pilot, um, let's say a private pilot, not in the advanced stages, um, what is the one technique lesson or piece of wisdom you'd want to get across in that lesson? I'll I'll jump into this. Uh, this 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 is for every kind of pilot. Never ignore your gut feeling. The hairs on the back of your neck. If it doesn't feel right, stop ask yourself why if you still can't figure it out don't do it almost every time when someone gets into trouble they had a bad feeling before they got into it that something wasn't right and and until you get a, you, you said for a private pilot until you get a fairly broad amount of experience where you can relate it to something you've done before sometimes that gut feeling you know is is so important i think mine would be set personal minimums early and it's not something that needs to, it's not forever. Um, you'll always have personal minimums, but they'll change uh, as your experience grows. And once you've set your personal minimums, be it for visibility or ceiling or wind or rest or whatever it may be, pick any category, actually write them down, um, keep them with you. And that gives you a hard line to make decisions. That said, under the right conditions, push your comfort zone a little bit, because that's the only way that you're going to, you know, gain your experience, gain your comfort, but still respect your personal minimums. Again, it's a baseline from which to deviate. If we don't have a baseline at all, we don't have, there's no goalpost to measure by. And if you're pushing your comfort just a little bit to, you know, up your experience or to, you know, try going to a new place that you've never been to, get out of the little fishbowl. But like Kevin said, trust those hairs on the back of your neck, trust your gut, because if it's not right, it's not right. And, and, I had a meeting once with Bill Yearwood of the Transportation Safety Board, and he told me that every time he's been to an accident scene from a uh, CFIT or control flight into terrain, where a pilot pushed weather and ended up flying into the side of a mountain or the trees, they end up on site to investigate that crash 8, 10, 12 hours later, or sometimes even the next morning. And every time when they're sitting there on site, it's a clear blue sky while they're going through the wreckage and had they only waited the eight hours, they would have had those flying conditions as well. Yeah, I think something that ties in well with both of those is an exercise that I used to really enjoy doing with my students um, was, so if it's something that's, you know, not within your personal minimums or something that, you know, gets your anxiety up a little bit, then do it with an instructor or, you know, like push those boundaries with uh, an experienced pilot that you trust that's there that knows the plane. It's an exercise that worked well in t the training aircraft we used was to go and hang out in a stall. Like stall the airplane, keep it stalled, see how the plane reacts. Because in training, you're taught to recover from a stall. You're taught like, these are the symptoms. Okay, it's happened. Now let's apply a recovery as fast as you can, minimize that altitude loss. But I think that ends up creating this fear of that side of the power curve and that fear in students of like, this is something to be avoided at all costs. This is how to get out of it. But it's still the aircraft is still like at least training aircraft. They still want to be able to fly. Like you can stall it, let go, and it's going to figure itself out 
with enough altitude. So getting students comfortable with that side of the back of the power curve and, and allowing them to experience these like adverse flight conditions, but get comfortable in it and see how the, the aircraft responds before before applying that recovery. And I'd see people's confidence with the aircraft, especially with approaches, because you're flying you know, in that area of the power curve that their confidence just went way, to, way up with it. Awesome. Well, I think we'll uh, end this one there. That was uh, a great discussion. We could go on forever. We will revisit some of these topics, I'm sure. So thank you, Kate, Ryan, and Kevin for coming on. Thanks, I'm already Roy. looking forward to the next one. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah, it's, me uh, too. Pleasure. For those of you listening, thanks for tuning in. If you've got a topic you'd like to hear discussed, please leave us a comment or review wherever you're listening. And more than anything, please share this with your aviation friends and anyone else you think might be interested in learning more about the flying we get to do here in Canada. There's so many opportunities out there to inspire and be inspired. If you're on Instagram or Facebook, follow at Flying British Columbia. I post pretty much daily on Instagram. And please check out bcaviation.ca and become a member of the BC General Aviation Association. It's free to join and you get some great perks such as the Private Airstrip Access Program and the BCGA Members Facebook Group. It's probably one of the most friendly and motivating Facebook communities I've been involved in and was a big factor in getting me into flying. And lastly, I know it's just the first episode so I don't expect it. But if you feel inclined to support what we're trying to do here with the videos and podcasts, you can support us at patreon.com slash flyingbc. Thanks for joining us, and I challenge you to share your love of aviation with someone new this week. Flying BC is a project of Formula Photographic.